Okay, class, welcome back. In this lecture, we're gonna cover the basic metabolic panel of BMP. And again, similar to C, uh, CBC, uh, we don't really use this uh, kind of layout as much as, as kind of the, from the old handwritten notes, but you may see this uh, utilized in uh, the chart in the, you know, in the, maybe the top part of the panel. But uh, again, just like the CBC, it'll be in columns with the normal, normal values uh, to the right or to the left to compare uh, trends for that patient or how they fall along that normative um, continuum. Uh, the, C, the BMP is a reflection of different electrolytes or the basic metabolic um, molecules that we need to, for our organs to function. So that's sodium, potassium, as you guys remember from physiology, chloride, bicarbonate, um, fun, which uh, we'll get into, uh, which is, you know, um, uh, blood urea nitrium, uh, blood urea nitrate, creatinine, um, and glucose. So again, similar to our rationale and reasoning for our other lab values, um, we're gonna follow similar trends and using um, our clinical judgment to determine whether a patient's appropriate. We don't use hard cutoffs any, as much for these anymore as well, um, but we're just gonna review some of the normative trends or values for these patients. So again, sodium, really important for managing and maintaining fluid balance as well as nerve conduction, you know, which one of the primary ions we exchange along with potassium. Um, a normal range for sodium is anywhere between 134 to 142 mils for EQ. Again, every lab is going to be slightly different. You can think most people, we want them to be above about or around 100, 140 values below 130. We start getting a little concerned for, um, you know, cramps, weakness. Think of it, you know, if you're you know, if you're, for an example, a sports situation, you're exercising, you know, you're sweating out a lot of salty sweat, you're losing a lot of sodium, which can, you know, lead to cramping, lead to spasms, lead to weakness, confusion. Um, you know, that uh, can happen both in situations of dehydration as well as overhydration. You can have hypervolemic uh, hyponatremia, um, such as individuals that are like, um, you know, consuming way too much water. Um, you can see it also in patients with uh, cirrhosis, or liver damage. Um, this can get particularly concerning because when the amount of sodium in uh, fluids, uh, the fluid outside the cell drops, water, um, we end up having fluid uh, flow into the uh, fluid flow into the cell, right? Because normally we have a slightly different um, amount of sodium on the outside. If it's too low, we actually create a situation where the blood is a uh, is hypertonic relative to the cell. So we end up having, um, sorry, hypotonic to the cell. So we end up having blood flow into the cell leading to swelling, which can be fatal actually. So again, you know, normally in our cells, we have slightly, uh, slightly less sodium than on the outside. If that shifts and there's not a, a lot of sodium in the blood or it's too low, we end up having, you know, the cell, the cell, their intracellular fluid ends up becoming relatively hypertonic to the uh, extracellular fluid, and we end up having water flow in, which is a very, very dangerous situation. Hypernatremia, we often see in patients who are hypovolemic, maybe you didn't drink enough water. Um, there's basically just too much salt in the blood in that situation. Uh, potassium, again, will affect the excitability of the heart or really any nerve. Um, abnormal values can lead to cardiac arrhythmias. Hypokalemia is when we have uh, too low of it. This can occur with certain diuretics. We talked about some of those, Lasix being, being one of them. Um, now, when we have too low um, potassium, we can see a flattened T wave, slight arrhythmias. But if it's really low, we can even see muscle weakness, potentially respiratory failure because of respiratory muscle weakness. Uh, hyperkalemia, when values go well beyond five, um, we can see even we can see uh, peak T waves in these individuals uh, or a shortened uh, QT interval. Um, and again, potentially changes to fluid distribution depending on, um, you know, again, the, the, the flow of uh, plasma or fluid I mean, in and out of the uh, intercellular and extracellular uh, spaces. Um, our normal range, again, 3.7 to 5.1. Again, anything too low, we call that hypokalemia. Anything too high, calling that hyperkalemia. Again, every value is going to be slightly different. Um, I think the, you know, some labs use 5.0 as the exact cutoff. Chloride, again, similar to other electrolytes, you know, super important for uh, regulating uh, membrane potentials, but also in regulating acid-base balance, normal ranges for 
um, chloride 95 to 105. Hyperchloremia, often most, like, most electrolyte imbalances occur in response to dehydration. Um, often doesn't cause symptoms, right, if we have too much. Um, can lead to metabolic acidosis, possibly. Uh, hypochloremia, when we have too low, we often see these patients with diarrhea, again, any, any changes of fluid volume or fluid intake. Um, and again, similar to, that, similar to hyperchloremia, not a lot of symptoms, and it's very, very rarely occurs in, in isolation by itself. And again, our normal range is 95 to 100. And uh, typically, chloride typically goes in the same direction as, as sodium changes. So sodium increases, chloride usually increases, sodium is decreased, chloride usually decreases. Bicarbonate, uh, so most carbon dioxide is hydrated to carbonic acid, um, which quickly dissociates into its conjugate base, bicarbonate, and its conjugate acid, H+. Um, acid. And again, um, the more carbonic acid, the more um, we have, you know, the more, um, the more carbon dioxide we have, the more this, this kind of breaks down. Um, bicarbonate is super crucial in maintaining uh, pH. It's our buffer, right? It's a conjugate base to hydrogen ion on normal values um, between 22 and 26. This gets more relevant and we'll spend more time focusing on this in our ABG lecture, which you guys have. Um, but again, uh, just remembering, again, too much bicarbonate going to be in a uh, situation of alkalosis, too little bicarbonate going to be in a situation of acidosis. Blood urea nitrate, again, um, this is due to a... Um, as we age, we typically have lower muscle mass. Um, we'll typically see lower creatinine values, but if someone's really malnourished, we could also see it as well. Um, increases, we could see this again in kidney disease, similar, similar trends as uh, the bun. You may also see people refer to the bun creatinine ra uh, ratio, which gives us an indication whether this is an acute kidney injury or dehydration. The principle behind this is that the fact that both the, the bun and creatinine are freely filtered by the glomerulus. Um, the normal ratio of bond to creatinine should be 10 to 1. If it's between 10 to 20, right, so it's higher than normal, but less than 20 um, to 1, it's likely due to kidney dysfunction. And then anything higher than 20, <clears throat> we're thinking this is probably due to some form of dehydration, which can get, you know, helpful for, um, you know, differential diagnosis. <clears throat> now, glucose... Again, we've covered this quite extensively in our uh, diabetes lecture. Again, normal ranges for non-diabetic patients going to be between 70 to 100. Um, just as a reminder, in the acute care setting, uh, post-surgery, there's going to be an immune response. It's going to be a cortisol release potentially. We're just going to raise blood glucose. So don't be too surprised <clears throat> if blood glucose is slightly elevated after surgery, especially considering a lot of patients coming into an acute uh, hospital may have diabetes. Not too uncommon. Um, we get concerned when the blood sugar is too low, get hypoglycemia below 70. Um, we have the typical symptoms that we've talked about before. Hyperglycemia um, are situations where the blood sugar is too elevated, um, which reflects maybe a potential um, disturbance in glucose homeostasis. Um, we, get, we get more concern, especially when values are above 240, because that can lead or reflect someone who's going to be in uh, ketoacidosis or may lead to ketoacidosis. And again, we have our typical symptoms and, and signs there. Now, again, exercise considerations for glucose, again, can be too low or too high. If it's too low, you don't have enough fuel to take into the body. We typically give a patient a carbohydrate snack um, before starting, and again, following that rule of 15. Anything above 250, it's a relative contraindication to exercise. Again, we talk about this, um, that... The, you know, if someone's blood sugar is that high, it, it may reflect that they have an inability to uptake um, any of that glucose into the muscle. Again, our muscles are our largest sink for glucose. So if we begin to exercise, again, that initial, there's an initial spike and release of blood glucose into the blood um, from glycogen to start fueling cells. Well, if we're already not able to take in what's there now, if we add even a little bit more, it may be leading lead to further complications. So exercise could potentially... You know, though we, we associate exercise as lowering and, and improving glucose sensitivity, that's assuming that we have the receptors to uptake 
glucose from the blood into the cell. In someone who's that high, that, that might not be the case. Again, we go by the trend, what's their normal value? If someone's blood glucose at rest is in the 200s, 250 might not be as a concern. Now, we're thinking maybe long-term you know, management, different story, but in the hospital, it might be a little bit different. So always factor in the trends, clinical status, and the chronicity of their condition and what, what it looks like normally for them. And as a re reminder, uh, that rule of 15 is that ADA guideline where, again, if it's low, below 70, give a snack, wait 15 minutes, recheck, and then so on and so forth. Uh, there's also glycated hemoglobin. Again, that is a value looking at uh, chronic ranges. Uh, not as much of a, a value that comes up too, too much in um, acute care. We're more looking at the fasting glucose, but this is something you may see as well. Again, normal range for A1C is between four to six. A diabetic is going to be a little bit higher because they typically have higher blood glucose throughout their just normal day-to-day -day life. Um, meaning there's going to be more glycation or bonding of glucose to red blood cells, thus the percentage of those will be higher. Um, we typically like to see those values below 7. So if you see someone in the hospital where A1C is like 8, 9, that reflects maybe someone one with chronic diabetes and potentially poor diabetic control. So something to be mindful of when you're mobilizing that patient um, you know, and working with them in the acute care setting. Um, last couple of values to talk about are magnesium. Magnesium Again, not, not something that you're, you're typically going to be screening for too much in, in the acute care setting, but it is an electrolyte. It is important for maintaining normal, uh, normal, normal neuromuscular activity. Values typically pretty low, about 1.2 to 1.9 mils per equal, mil equals per liter. Typically, when we see too low values, we, that's in someone's, again, who's dehydrated, has diarrhea, protracted vomiting, alcohol abuse, um, certain medications. Um, and malabsorption, right? We may see alterations just generally in neuromuscular function, tetany, weakness, ataxia, uh, potentially seizure concerns. Again, just be mindful of those things when you're working with those patients. Hypermagnesia, again, um, typically due to renal insufficiency. Um, normally, you excrete a lot of magnesium um, or, and you're able to. So if you're not able to restore balance, there's something wrong with a kidney, right? So if it's too high, you can get... Uh, uh, vasodilation, and so very low blood pressure. Blood pressure. Um, if it's super high, you may go into respiratory failure because it, it's going to disturb um, and hyperpolarize potentially the uh, the membrane potentials, leading to uh, an inability of the, the muscles to contract effectively, leading to respiratory failure and paralysis. Calcium, again, super important for regulating uh, normal cell signals. Again, different ranges between which facilities you use. Normal range is anywhere between 8.7 to 10. Um, hypocalcemia, we get concerned because of, um, it's, it's again, calcium's ability to me regulate membrane potentials as well as to contract muscles. Um, so if it's super low, we may uh, see altered mental status, weakness, cramps, um, mild cases, usually not that big of a concern, uh, but just something to be aware of. Hypercalcemia, typically you see if excessive parathyroid hormones, so someone with thyroid disease or hyperthyroidism, um, or renal failure and malignancy. Again, similar to hypocalcemia and low values, often asymptomatic and severe values because of its ability to regulate uh, membrane potentials, it can lead to uh, significant changes in terms of neuromuscular function and cardiac function. All right. Creatine kinase um, is an isoenzyme. Again, it's released into the blood when brain or cardiac muscles injured. Again, our muscles contain enzymes that uh, metabolize creatine. If those muscles die and rupture, they release their, their contents into the blood. Normally, creatine kinase, we should see anywhere between 300 to 170, like not a ton, um, wide ranges of normal. Um, <clears throat> if we see elevations, right, could be due to a lot of different things. We have different isoforms, MM, skeletal muscles, BB, brain, and then uh, CKMB we see in uh, the heart. So if we see elevated amounts of this, and there's typically very low amounts of uh, CKMB relative to total creatine kinase, that could reflect maybe some sort of cardiac um, infarction or myocardial infarction leading to cell death in the heart, rupturing and, and leaching those enzymes into the blood. Uh, the other 
cardiac enzyme we'll see again. These aren't typically part of the, the BMP and neither is creatine kinase, but they kind of fall along this similar pattern. Cardiac enzymes, again, we've talked about they will elevate in response to myocardial infarction. Um, normal ranges, we typically don't have troponins um, in our blood as well at all. At all. Um, troponins, again, part of the, the functional unit of the muscle. If those you know, are elevated, that means, well, there's, there's a, that, that came from the cells that ruptured and died and spilled their contents into the blood, which happens with a myocardial infarction. Um, and again, we shouldn't have any, so even a slight elevation, 0 0.9, 0 0.10 nanograms, um, you know, it could reflect some sort of damage into the heart. Now, you may see troponins and then cardiac troponins. The troponins could be from really any muscle, and we have specific isoforms, uh, CTNI uh, and CTNT, uh, the inhibitory and the troponin myosin binding uh, uh, subunits, specifically from cardiac troponins, because again, troponins can be from a lot of different things. The big thing to take away from this is that you must review the trends, right? So after a heart attack, right, troponins will peak and then the valley, right? They'll go up and then come down. We don't want to be working with patients on this side, really, of, of, this, of this process, right? However, if they've been downtrending a couple times, their clinical status is stable, the ECG looks okay, that may be an opportunity to start working with that patient. Again, you use your clinical judgment, systems review. Typically, most facilities say, you know, at least two, two downtrending values before the patient's stable to start considering therapy, because if their values are still peaking, right, that means that heart's still infarcting, right, which is not a stable situation for them to be in. Um, another value you might see as well is B-type natriuretic peptide, which again is released from the ventricles in response to stretch. Typically, this is something that we're monitoring for heart failure. It's a way for us to track long-term severity. Uh, typically, values below 100 indicates no heart failure because we're not producing a lot of stretch. And then uh, the, the more and more stretch we have, the more and more um, BNP. Again, this is something we also need to look at from chronic standpoint, what's their values at normally, and what's their clinical disposition, because maybe someone is normally in a, a functional class two, right? So their BNP being 300 isn't as big of a concern as someone who's normally at a class one, right? Again, when you see a heart failure to compensation, quite often their BNP uh, levels will increase quite substantially, maybe even above 900 when they're in a decompensation. Other values you might see as well, um, serum albumin, again, measurement of circulating protein, the more, uh, more or less, if we have more protein, right, in the blood, um, indicating maybe an inability to, uh, you know, clear that from the blood, maybe renal disease, maybe there's inflammation, we're breaking down muscle and there's a spiked amount, um, or maybe they're just dehydrated. Um, if there is too little, maybe there's poor liver function, malnutrition or thyroid disease. And again, we've got different cutoffs for what we're thinking, whether it's a nutritional issue or some sort of um, um, other issue and what, what concerns they may have. <clears throat> Another value you may look at if you're working at patients with poor kidneys or really anyone who comes to the hospital may have an acute kidney injury is glomular, glomerular filtration rate, right? Again, we perform our filt filtration at the glomerus. Typically, the value is above 90 for a healthy adult. Anything below 60 indicates some sort of kidney damage, and then the extent of that will determine is determined by the how how low it goes. Sometimes it can go as low as 15, which is really really bad. I've seen that clinically. Um, there is going to be an expected decrease of age. However, most people should be above 90. Again, we use a systems based approach. Some patients, you know, come in with chronic kidney disease. So their values are a little bit on the lower end. Again, most people maybe post you know, admission will have a slightly reduced value. Um, we have a whole separate unit on blood gases, so I'll leave it up there for you guys, just remembering our normal values, and then um, we'll end up here and we'll then uh, we'll finish with some lines. Thank you so much.